We have always stated that um, our independence cannot be complete if in fact there is any part of the world where the black man is not accorded his rightful position in society. Africans, the Mau Mau were freedom fighters, but to the Europeans, they were terrorists. For it is that band of fanatics whose bloody deeds have cast a dark shadow across the face of Kenya. The British used the police and army to round up suspects from the Kikuyu villages. They dropped 50,000 tons of bombs to try to destroy their camps. The Mau Mau who tried to shoot down the British planes were celebrated as folk heroes. The Mau Mau concluded there was no alternative to violence. 
They used homemade weapons to terrorize European settlers, attacking isolated farmhouses and police stations. Many Africans opposed the violence, including Jomo Kenyatta. Despite a lack of evidence, he was accused of Mau Mau links and imprisoned. 80,000 suspects were detained and interrogated. So he suddenly found himself in this vacuum again. Yeah, and he volunteered to be director of information and acting treasurer. Of course, people like Odede and Abori had tried, Odede was again also cleared and detained. So most people feared being, having anything to do with the cow, or less to go. When, uh, when Mau Mau was on the rampage and Jomo Kenyatta was given the image of a monster because his own image was so ghastly in, in the sight of whites, the image of Tom and Boya immediately became acceptable because Kenyatta seemed to be so irresponsible and Boya became responsible. He became acceptable, responsible, you know, and made everybody happy. So they supported him, they backed him up, made him prominent throughout the world. Kenyatta made him, he didn't make himself. And he's in, he was intelligent enough to know it. So when Kenyatta got out, he supported Kenyatta. He realized that can, the contribution of Kenyatta made him what he was. And because he was intelligent enough, he, had, he was blessed with sufficient insight to see the role that Kenyatta and the Mau Mau played in his own uh, prominence, an image of respectability and acceptability. He continued to support Kenyatta. He becomes the Joint Trade Union, again, which is not tribal. It's a, a group which has been led by people like uh, Makansi and uh, Kubai. Those who had been, most of them had been detained. But even those who were still there, it was all Kenyan. So there's nothing low about trade, that trade union organization from a person who really was brought up by everybody. He hasn't acquired his closeness to the Luo or to anybody else. And this whole background is us. I think that, that is crucial in Anderson. Mm -hmm. In fact, Mboya only became a Luo in death. You'll never do. Will you press for the release of Jomo Kenyatta? Certainly, yes. How? Again, by intensifying our efforts and more pressure on the British government and also the Kenya government and using whatever influences we've gained from this present constitution for um, further efforts to secure his release. What's your view of Dr. Nkrumah's vision of a union of the whole of black Africa? I am quite sure that every African leader would like to see a greater and closer relationship between the various African territories and uh, the various African states. Do you believe that one day Kenya will be governed by Africans? I believe that one day Kenya will be governed by a democratic government representative and elected by the people. And by the people I include anybody who decides to make Kenya his home.
in how many years? who accepts to be treated as um, an equal citizen with everybody else. Well, Mr. Emborium, uh, it's small for, it's hard for small nations to live alone. Do you hope for your country of federation with other small African, middle African nations? What is it that you want for the future? The All African People's Conference discussed this whole question of federations or a United States of Africa. And we are being realistic in this matter by our decision at Accra that certain regions constitute workable units that might be treated together in terms of economic planning, in terms of various social or economic uh, programs, and also with the hope that in uh, trying to achieve this, certain political units could be created. We have as a long-term objective the possibility of a United States of Africa. Would you affiliate with the Arabs or the northern half of Africa? In our present um, attitude, we regard that countries like Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, the Sudan, which I, I think you are referring to, are part of Africa. And consequently, uh, it is quite possible that um, a workable unit could be created in the north, and which later on would probably associate yes. with other units yes. in the rest of Africa. Yes. You have said that you would offer Europeans the hand of friendship. Well, I believe at the Accra meeting uh, in December, you said Europeans should scram out of Africa. Now, what did you mean by that? I am very glad that you raised this point because I think it is often difficult for us to be uh, sure that we are correctly reported. And I want to take this opportunity to say exactly what I said. I said at Accra that in contrast to the 90, uh, to the 1884 Berlin Conference, the Accra Conference was convened to unite Africa to create the African community. And whereas the Berlin Conference started what history has referred to as the scramble for Africa, in Accra we were meeting to state in definite terms to the colonial powers, not European individuals, to the colonial powers, that they would have to scram out of Africa. I have also heard you reported as saying that you are not for Africa for Africans only, that all would be equal before the law. Is that true? This is true, except I want to qualify that statement by saying, whereas Africa for Africans is quite uh, a logical and uh, a satisfactory phrase to use, the qualification is that it is dependent on one's definition of African. Now, so long as the definition of African includes any person, regardless of his color, who has decided to make Africa his home, I do not see why anyone should quarrel with us. And I want to submit that when Europeans emigrate to Australia, they call themselves Australians. When they emigrate to Canada, they are quite content to be called Canadians. I see no reason why they should be ashamed to be called Africans. Let us hope that change there will be. But this change cannot be in terms of pious resolutions and words. It's got to be translated into action. For it is only then that we shall know that there is a definite departure from the, fact, from the past and that America intends to take on a new role to stand for the things which she
Well, it's, uh, it, uh, it is pretty obvious that um, the British and uh, Belgian governments have been very much involved in the uh, conspiracy in uh, the secession of Katanga. It uh, appears to us, uh, those of us who have uh, looked at the Katanga situation, that the British and Belgian governments, including the French government to some extent, and Portugal, are very much interested in safeguarding the uh, various interests, financial and business interests, and mining interests, in Katanga, rather than in the protection and safeguarding of the national uh, security and unity of the Congolese people. Now, sir, uh, you as a leading uh, pan-Africanist have always objected to foreign interference in Africa. Now, wouldn't you say that the United Nations campaign against Katanga and against Mr. Shombe amounted to foreign interference? Not at all. On the contrary, the United Nations was invited to the Congo by the central government. This, the United Nations did not intervene until invited. And at present, they are acting in the Congo, firstly, on the advice of the African states at the United Nations, and secondly, on the advice and in consultation and cooperation with the central government of the Congo. Our criticism has been that the United Nations has been restrained too much in its act actions in Katanga by world powers. That again includes Britain, Belgium, France, who do not wish to see United Nations take decisive action, again because they wish to protect their interests, the interests which are behind Shombe's secessionist uh, uh, tactics. Do you see any future for Mr. Shombe in, in the uh, Congo unified government? That very well depends. At the moment, most of us think of him as a crook uh, whose word can never be uh, trusted, uh, but the future should be left to the Congolese people themselves. from Africa, Tom Oboya of Kenya. A human struggle. The struggle in Africa is one for nothing less and nothing more than the eradication of poverty, disease, and ignorance. And in this context, you and ourselves are all engaged in the same struggle that can aptly be summarized in terms of a struggle for political freedom, for economic opportunity, and for human dignity. This is my message to you. And I and millions of other people join you today in solidarity for the success of the struggle in which we are all involved. Thank you. A voice from America. Martin Luther King. As I stand here and look out upon the thousands of Negro faces and the thousands of white faces intermingled like the waters of a river, I see only one face, that is the face of the future. this great historic assembly, this unprecedented gathering of young people, I cannot help thinking that a hundred years from now, the historians will be calling this not the beat generation, but the generation of integration.
was 1959 when I learned that there was a program between Honorable Mboya and the Kennedy of the United States of America. I didn't know what to do when I was taking my studies. I inquired the program. I was told it's an arrangement between Honorable Mboya, late Mboya, with President Kennedy that uh, children or students who did not have an opportunity to continue with, their, uh, with education here in Kenya can apply from uh, American colleges and universities and when they are admitted the Kennedy's family will airlift the students to America. It so happened that I had just finished my, my London matriculation called, uh, examination of which I was accepted by the same program to go to America. We were picked from different areas and we met in the plane. It was difficult to know who is who going where until we arrived in New York Four of, us, four of us, four boys, Frank Namtete, Samuel Ngola, and uh, Elliston Kiwinda Mongola. And by we were uh, announced to be boarding to Little Rock, Arkansas. My uh, flight is a famous one. Is, it was my through media nicknamed the great famous flight of 81 students. I'm thankful for American education and the arrangement made by Mboya and Kennedy that not only myself, many of the Kenyans who came back after that program came to teach Others went in the government to do something else, and I think the program is, if I can say, if I know any program was uh, geared to open the, the relationship between the Kenya government and the American government. And today we are proud to say from 1959, because I traveled with a gentleman called Obama, who is the father of the President of the United States, the program can continue if I may uh, be asked. Kenyatta University College, I was appointed by the Teacher Service Commission to go and complete a program called S1 Teachers uh, to Teach Secondary Schools. I went over there, completed it, 1975. So I was transferred to Thogoto Teachers College. Thogoto Teachers College, I have taught 13 years. That's where I was as a lecturer, uh, chaplain, and the head of religious department for 13 years. Then I retired. Kenyatta has just been allowed to give his first press conference since his conviction nine years ago, and Nigel Ryan flew to Maralal to interview him for this program. Mr. Kenyatta, some people here are afraid that your release from custody would be a signal for more tribal violence in Kenya. That, Pre that is not so. You think there is absolutely no danger of... No danger at all. That's only marginal danger. How would you summarize your policy? Political po policy? I am an African nationalist. 
wanting my people uh, to have their own independence, just like any other country. Would and you... I don't, don't think uh, there is any reason why Kenya will not get her independence today. Uh, look at Tanganyika, look at um, uh, Somaliland, uh, look at the, um, uh, Sudan just next door. Uh, I don't think these uh, territories are more advanced than Kenya. I do not think so. Uh, the only thing is that there are some stubborn uh, people in Kenya who do not want Africans to get their, their freedom. I have dedicated my life to the service of my people. And no material gain or anything else which will make me um, move from that line. That is, I'll continue to fight for the freedom of my people as long as I live. In Nairobi, the crisis has hit business, and capital is leaving the country at the rate of a million pounds a month. The Asian middlemen have suffered worst of all. Many have had to shut up shop or cut prices drastically to stay in business. Africans, too, are out of work, many of them Kikuyu tribesmen recently released from prison. Outside the labor exchange, crowds of them gather daily, unable to find jobs. On the surface, Nairobi is still prosperous and peaceful. But there's no doubt in anybody's mind that independence must come. The only question that remains to be resolved is when. When would you like to see Kenya independent? Well, I don't care any day. Immediately. I would very much like to see it independent when the government here and in England consider that the Africans have sufficient knowledge to run it successfully and will bring prosperity to the country. As long as I can see Northern Frontier is very behind, I don't, I don't think Kenya is able to get independent at this moment, but unless another 20 years time. Yeah, you better next year, and Kenyatta must be released immediately. Any time, even now, if possible. Any time at all? Any time. Well, I think as a businessman, and I think I can also talk for the majority of other business people, well, the sooner the better. But of course, there is a big if about it. We've got to have responsible people that are fit to govern us. For the moment, the crisis seems to have eased. But among the white settlers in Nairobi and the surrounding countryside, the memory still remains of the 95 Europeans and hundreds of Africans who were hacked to death in the days of Mau Mau violence. If Europeans stay on, will there be more violence? If they leave, will there be another Congo? At both ends of the scale, views are strong, feelings run high. Can there be a compromise or must there be a collision? The answer to this depends, I think, on two factors. Will the Africans pause for a moment in the race for independence to realize that in their own best interest, they must make it attractive for Europeans to stay on? And for their part, are the Europeans ready in their heart of hearts to accept that Kenya is not a county of the British Isles, but part of a rapidly evolving Africa? Last here comes Kenyatta, flown from detention in Maralal and driven on the last stage of his journey in a police vehicle. He's surrounded by reporters and he gives an impromptu press conference on the steps of his new home. My first message to my people will be to thank them for what they have done for me and to ask them to keep calm. Uh, that is, not to make any trouble uh, in their rejoicing for my return. And um, uh, through there we can build a united Kenya. Mr. Kenyatta, do you think you'll be able to form a political party uniting Kanu and Kadu? I do not recognize, uh, I mean, favor one of them. I say I belong to both of them. What are your political ideals, Mr. Kenyatta? What is your political philosophy? 
my political philosophy? Well, I, I think my political philosophy is, well, if I can say, love thy neighbor as uh, thyself. <laughs> Who is your neighbor? Yeah. I think the world is my neighbor. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Vervoort once described his policy as good neighborliness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that can be sorted out. If it's made possible for you to take a seat in LegCo in the Parliament, would you do that? There again, I cannot put myself in LegCo. That, I leave that to my people. If they elect me to sit in a LegCo, I would gladly do so. Would you like to do that yeah. soon, if possible? As soon as my people want me to do it. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest problem facing Africa today? There's many big problems facing Africa today. Uh, Africa today. That is, one, we must eliminate ignorance. Two, hunger, disease. Those are the, um, I mean, many other uh, problems. But I think those are the uh, most important. Kenya is a poor country, and its best future probably lies in the idea of an East African federation with Uganda and Tanganyika and possibly Zanzibar. One measure of Kenyatta's success will be whether Kenya manages to achieve that. Good night. Back as the house has responsibility that now rests. We have certainly not solved the problems of Kenya, but I believe we can claim that this conference, by reaching this agreement, has made it possible to find a solution to the problems of Kenya. Throughout the conference, my party and I never uh, uh, my party and I never de de deviated uh, from these objectives and our primary concern at every moment has been the future welfare of our country, economic, political as well as social welfare. Uh, it is because I believe uh, this so strongly that after every, uh, after very careful consideration, I have agreed to the formation of a coalition government. Looking back today, I am glad to be able to say that Kano is proud of its contribution at this conference. We are fully prepared to complete, to cooperate in the task ahead and invite all other parties and sections to work with us in this noble task. It is necessary that I state clearly at this juncture that Kano shall not tolerate any effort or maneuver to slow down Kenya's independence. We believe that Kenyans are one nation. It is also consistent with the African people's past and present efforts to secure unity. It is also the logical answer to the challenge which Kenya or, or any new nation must face after independence. The consolidation of independence, urgent economic reconstruction and development, the need to make an impact and have influence at Pan-African and international affairs must be our immediate aid. What we have been struggling for is to redeem our country from the yoke of colonialism.
Haram Pay! Haram Pay! Haram Pay! Nama Shamba Yetu Haram Pay! Nama Fugo Yetu Haram Pay! Nama Sirka Yetu Tukubu Haram Pay! Well, we inherited a certain situation. It is not of our making. For example, most of the uh, good farming land in the highlands was reserved originally for European farmers. So we have to bring Africans into this area. Uh, most of commerce and trade has been mono monopolized by Asians, and we now have to bring Africans into this area. Well, this expression cannot just be defined in one word because uh, it represents a lot of things. It represents, for example, our belief that in Africa, the kind of economic, social and political institutions that make sense must find their meaning in the African setup. Uh, that any new organization which we bring up must be based on some traditional concept to life. Uh, it must not just be imported from outside. For example, we are uh, uh, clan-minded, we are tribal-minded in that we are communal in our concept of life. Now, it is necessary that our new institutions are based on this approach, what we have called in our definition of African socialism, mutual social responsibility. That is, that a person is not just an individual, he's part of a system, he's part of a community. He has responsibilities within that community. He has duties to perform in that community. But in turn, the community has also got responsibility to him. They have duties towards him and his children. Um, this is a very important concept. The other concept is that every person has got equal value and, and worth. Although some of our people in tradition, traditional life, had a lot of wealth, but their wealth was not really belonging to them as individuals. They held it almost in trust for the rest of the community. And when any of the members of the community got into trouble, or when he wanted um, uh, cows to pay dowry, he always looked to this as a position which he could also have access to so that um, there is this element of acknowledging individuals as equal humans in the community. The third one is that every decision was made through consultation and discussion and by a consensus. There was no question of one person deciding for the rest or um, of a minority deciding for the rest. The, there was also a proper procedure which laid down how every decision must be taken and at what level different decisions must be taken. There was a procedure by which certain members of the community attained seniority and by that seniority they were in a position to take certain decisions on behalf of the community. This is the democratic nature of our society. And lastly, there was the element that there was belief in a supreme, human, a supreme being that is, we paid homage to God or gods. We acknowledged there existed a God. We had certain religious functions, not denominational, but born in our tradition. Before we harvest, we have to do certain things to pay homage to God. Before we go to um, break the ground for cultivation, we pay homage to God. So that 
There is a distinction, for example, between what we believe in as socialists and what the communists believe in. There is a basic distinction. Um, and uh, the other distinction with other socialists, uh, say the democratic socialists, the Christian socialists of Europe, uh, and the Labour Party in Britain, is that we believe that our socialism must be founded from certain African traditions. Now, into this Kenya, uh, countries from around the world uh, want to help, to come with their aid. And I understand that you are interested in assistance from abroad, is that right? This is true, yes. Now, what kind of aid would you be mostly interested in, Mr. Mboya? Well, there are two uh, major problems in a developing country like ours. One is the shortage of manpower and the second is the shortage of capital. Capital both for government uh, activities and also for investment in the private sector. So we are interested in aid, in uh, bringing into the country enough capital to facilitate our development. We are also interested in aid in terms of investments those in, who wish to invest in the private sector. But you see, if you have capital alone and you don't have the required manpower, you cannot use the capital. And so we are always also interested that where we get capital, we should also get some technical assistance, people who can help us to carry out our projects. Um, but our uh, long-term objective is to move away from aid so that we can concentrate on trade. Our policy is to uh, minimize aid and expand trade as the years go by. And we are very anxious to develop trade relations with outside countries. I think mostly we want to develop trade relations with our neighboring countries within Africa because uh, in the final analysis, intra-African trade is more important to us than trade with foreign countries who have a very highly sophisticated economic uh, setup. Uh, how is uh, your thinking uh, when you think of the slogan Africa for Africans? What role will the Europeans and the Indians play in the future Kenya? Well, um, I think one thing is to distinguish between what this means in terms of government uh, what it means in terms of government is that the governments of Africa must be African governments. This is really what it means. Uh, beyond that, we concede, like every other part of the world, that uh, you will have foreigners uh, living amidst our people and uh, they will be governed by the laws of the land. Also, we have in our constitution provision for other people to become citizens and there are a number of uh, Asians and Europeans who have become Kenya citizens since independence and they will enjoy the same rights as myself or any other African. So to that extent they are Africans um, and uh, they should just like myself say Africa is for the Africans. What we're really saying is to exclude foreign powers from interfering in our own uh, local affairs and also to um, eliminate uh, colonialism and uh, minority rule from Africa. So if I came here and settled and behaved well and applied for citizenship and acquired citizenship, could I also be a member of your parliament and also be a minister? Yes, in fact we have a, uh, uh, a white man who is a minister in the Kenya government. We have another one who is a minister in the Tanzania government. There's another one who is a minister in Zambia. So there are many of white people who are already uh, members of parliament and even members of the cabinet. In the case of the Kenya minister, Mr. Mackenzie, he's not only a white man, he's a former South African, but he's become a Kenya citizen and he's accepted by the Kenya people. He's a member of our party and uh, as a result, he has become a minister since independence. Now, the East African cooperation between Tanzania, Uganda and Kenya has been very close, but now Tanzania has broken out more or less and made a strongly socialist uh, goal. Uh, does that affect the cooperation in any way, do you feel? 
Well, it, it, it does depend on how this is done. So long as there is harmony between our policies, we can continue in a cooperation. Uh, although our different countries may take different paths towards socialism. I don't believe that Tanzania is any more socialist than Kenya. It is just that their approach is slightly different from ours. Um, I think that eventually um, it, it will be possible to harmonize uh, some of these uh, approaches within uh, the context of East African cooperation. Are you thinking of nationalizing the banks and uh, these other companies which uh, Tanzania now do? No, we don't uh, think of doing the same things as Tanzania. Our policy on nationalization has been very well defined in our government paper on socialism. We will only nationalize where it becomes absolutely necessary to do so and where it is um, because there is no other means of securing the right responses to the economic needs of the country. But we do not nationalize indiscriminately, nor do we believe in it dogmatically. It has been said uh, by people who know quite well the problems of the world that the, the underdeveloped countries become poorer and poorer and the rich countries become richer and richer, that the, the distance is growing larger and getting smaller. Uh, is that uh, true to any extent and how should we overcome this problem, do you think? This is very true and I have defined it very, very comprehensively in my speech at Lagos, which I have since published, um, showing how difficult the terms of aid, terms of loan and so on have been getting and also the terms of trade between the developed and developing countries and also showing how these Per capita incomes in the developed countries have been going up, whereas those in the developing countries have re been remaining stagnant or even uh, reducing. So there is a definite problem, and it's a problem which must be solved. This is why I propose that there's a need for a specific Africa development strategy, and that strategy is one intended to put Africa's development on an emergency basis and not just on a casual basis as it is today. It is one which will require that the developing countries make special contribution towards an African development uh, uh, fund. It is one which will require that African states themselves contribute towards a general uh, African uh, development program uh, which requires cooperation between them. This is um, something I could speak on for a long time but which I have defined in a comprehensive document now published as a Kenya government document under the title a strategy for um, uh, a, develop a development strategy for Africa which uh, you might find to be very interesting reading. In that uh, connection I would like to ask you how do you look upon the, the development now towards a more uh, common European market? Is that a threat, a, a further threat to the relation between the richer nations and the poorer nations? No, I don't think so. I think it is a logical development in Europe. I don't think there is very much of an alternative for Europe but to do this, especially with the end of colonial empires, uh, Europe has to reorganize herself. Does this uh, affect uh, Africa in any way? It does, because it means that Africa also must reorganize herself to meet the new European structure and also that we, also, uh, the European uh, concept of the common community must, uh, uh, be, must bear in mind that there are other parts of the world and not just Europe and that Europe owes those parts of the world some cooperation. So listen, man, I tell you, you know, 49 years ago today. Mm -hmm. So I was three and a half years old. I was zero years old. You were zero minus zero minus zero. Yeah. I was three and a half years old on July the 5th, mm -hmm. 1969. So 
we used to visit my aunt a lot and she was the uh, head housekeeper at the YWCA right here on Mamlaka Road. Mm-hmm. It's still there, right? It's still there. Yeah, YWCA. It's still there, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All those buildings around it were not there, but the mm-hmm. YWCA was this most... I used to love going there because they had a fantastic kitchen. They had great food. And she was the housekeeper, so she had her own apartment in there mm-hmm. with a balcony. And we used to hang out a lot. So we were there. Mom took us there on, on this day. And of course, we were doing our usual thing, e- eating, watching yeah. TV, all that stuff. And then all of a sudden... People were running in the street. My mom and my aunt were on the balcony and mm-hmm. people were running in the streets. Running in the streets. Yeah. Kelter skelter. And uh, they were wondering, of course, you know, they stopped a couple of them and asked them what happened. And they said, they just killed Tom. This was the word, they just killed Tom. And my mom mm-hmm. had worked for Tom Boyer at the National Assembly for a little while. So she knew him. So she broke out crying. She was crying. She just lost a personal friend. Can you imagine? She was crying uncontrollably. Mm-hmm. And we were wondering, who is this Tom guy who just got killed? Yeah. You know, who is this Tom guy? So then later on, it was explained to us. I mean, this guy was, was he was the biggest thing since Jomo Kenyatta, I would say. Mm. I mean, he was there at the forefront of Kano. He was there at Lancaster House fighting for the rights of a newly independent or soon to be independent Kenya. Mm -hmm. Young man, smart, brilliant, American educated. Born in 1930. By 1960, Mm -hmm. he was hanging out with the Kennedys. At 30. At 30. With the Kennedys in Kenny Bunkport or or, or, where they, you know, where they have their summer home. In, the, in, in, in Boston, Massachusetts. How brilliant was this guy? Unbelievable. They, they believed him. There's pictures of him with John F. Kennedy. Mm-hmm. John F. Kennedy. On YouTube. On YouTube, correct. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. I mean, this guy was so forward thinking. He really had this country's vision and future in mind. But then at the same time, him being so close to the Americans during that Cold War time, Mm -hmm. there were other powers that were not very happy. The Brits, for instance, who were Mm -hmm. about to give up one of their best and prized colonies, you know, were worried that, you know, we might, might shift too far to the American side. The Soviets then. Russians, Russians now. Soviets then were thinking, you know, a Cold War time, this guy is so close to the Americans, could he be CIA? All those theories were coming up. Mm-hmm. And this guy, I mean, Kenyatta first appointed him Minister for Constitutional Affairs and Justice, Justice and Constitutional Affairs, mm-hmm. first minister. Mm-hmm. And then later on, he was Economic Planning and Development Minister after that. And uh, the rivalry between Tom Boyer and Oginga Odinga was stark. Ogingo Odinga wanted this country to go the socialist way because he he was very close to the Soviets then. Mm-hmm. Tom Boyer, very capitalist, mm-hmm. uh, wanting you know uh, a capitalist economy, uh, let the economy dictate for itself. So there was a major major rifts within Kanu then, and uh, of course there was the talk of succession. Kenyatta, uh, seventy something years old. 75 oh no 75 plus 4 about 79 years old yeah. around you know in the late 60s mm-hmm. he was getting old and uh, people were wondering okay so the succession politics who was going to take over from mze you know once he passed on and of course top on the list thomas, thomas boyer. joseph boyer top of the list no question about it but of course the mm-hmm. cartels, the rivalry, the in the, the the kitchen cabinet. They had to come in. They, they had to come in and 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 you know and say you know look is this the way we want to go? By the way, Tom Boyer is the man solely responsible for the famous airlift. In the late fifties, he realized independence is round the corner. Mm-hmm. We do not have an educated. Uh, constituency here in Kenya. We don't have anyone who's educated enough to take over once the British leave. So what do we do? He called his friends, the Kennedys. And he says, hey, we have young, brilliant, smart Africans who would love to further their education, get a university degree. What can we do? Mm -hmm. Boom, 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 phone calls here, phone calls there. They started the airlift, giving Kenyans 
mostly in the beginning was mostly Kenyans, mm -hmm. free university education. One of the most famous recipients of this, yes, Barack Obama Senior. So, Imagine. So why not from Boya, Barack Obama? Would be still be in Kogelo. Barack Obama, this guy what? number forty-four would still mm -hmm. be in Kogelo, or maybe. Uh, yeah. Whatever. So, anyway, <laughs> so Barack Obama Senior, mm -hmm. Professor Wangari Mathai, a recipient as well. Yes, Doctor Julius Keanu. I remember Keanu. Mm -hmm. All this to, thanks to Tom Thomas Joseph Mboya, TJ they mm -hmm. called him. So you know, a whole mm -hmm. wave of Kenyans went to America. Obama Senior ended up in Hawaii, mm -hmm. where he uh, went to school there. Uh, and, and met his first wife <clears throat> and married her and uh, they had Barack Obama in Hawaii and then he left her and went to uh, to, to, to pursue a, I think a doctor's degree in, in, uh, at Harvard so he left the wife and, and, his, and his young son and uh, he, he went to Harvard found another wife and you know, married and yeah. that's another story for another day so mm -hmm. Mboya solely responsible and by the way mm -hmm. history has an uncanny way of repeating itself his daughter yeah, Dr. Susan Boyer, Kidero, definitely. She started the same thing with her foundation. Yeah, she it, has a foundation now. Right? Mm -hmm. Exact same thing. Helping un underprivileged kids to get an education overseas. And they've sent dozens of kids over the last couple of de uh, decade and change. Dozens and dozens of kids who have gone on to do mm -hmm. fantastic stuff and be employed by some of the you know, Fortune 500 companies <coughs> around the world. So... I tell you, man, uh, the seed does not fall far from the tree, you know? It doesn't. Yeah, so, on this day, mm -hmm. the man returns from an overseas trip. It was a Saturday. He returns from an overseas trip. Mm. And uh, he goes, drives straight, he's driving himself, drives straight to Charney's Pharmacy. Charney's Pharmacy was then on standards, no, uh, Government Road, sorry. Government Road, which is now Moy Avenue. Moy Avenue. It was on Government Road. And he knew the Chinese very well who owned the pharmacy. Okay. So he gets out of his car. He's chatting uh, to uh, Mrs. Chani mm -hmm. outside on the pavement, chatting, you know, hey, Tom, hey, hey, what's going on? And they're having a chat, chat, chat. Suddenly, uh, Mrs. Chani says, uh, later on, she said, I heard what sounded like a tire burst. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I... I think she had turned away to walk back into the pharmacy because um, Boya had purchased his stuff and she was walking him out, right? Right. They chatted a bit. She was turning back to go into the pharmacy and she heard a tire burst and she turned around as Tom Boya was falling on her. Oh. In her hands. Mrs. Chani. Yes. And of course, blood everywhere. And, 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 and this man was, you know, uh, this commotion, some guy running down the street. Mm -hmm. It was chaos. Of course, they call the ambulance, they call the hospital, uh, ambulance arrives, and he's been mortally wounded. There's no way they can revive him. Yeah. At the same time, the world's fam most famous cameraman, Mohammed Mo Amin, just happened to be hanging around you know, the city, the CBD mm -hmm. on a Saturday morning, mm -hmm. and he heard the shots ran straight towards the shot as everyone was running the other direction he ran straight towards the the, the the commotion and he found tom boyer right there lying on the pavement covered in blood ambulance comes in he jumps in the ambulance with tom boyer he's taking pictures click 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 he's taking all these pictures they get to nairobi hospital by that time it's too late and he's pronounced dead but mo muhammad amin is one who got those first pictures the next day it was plastered all over the world you know, mm -hmm. but uh, oh, it was a sad day, sad day. Two years before, his one of his best friends, John F. Kennedy, assassinated in the streets of Dallas, Texas. So Mboya was devastated by that death two years before, mm -hmm. no, 1963, six years before, mm -hmm. right? He was devastated by that death. Six years later, it's his, no, 63, right? 68, Kennedy's own brother, Robert Kennedy, who was running for president gets assassinated as well as he's wow. campaigning for presidency he gets assassinated shot they were at a convention uh, in a hotel he finishes his speech he says mm. he's on to chicago the next place and it was he was number one he was touted to win and take over the de uh, democratic leadership as he's going through the kitchen 
you know, uh, alternative route through the kitchen to your car. Yes. One of the chefs pulls a gun, shoots him point blank. Robert Kennedy. So Moya has lost JFK in 63. He's lost it, uh, Robert in 68. 68. Five years later. Five years later. Mm -hmm. On July 5th, 1969, it's Tom Boyer's turn. A tragedy of Shakespearean proportions. Three good friends die Dead. in the same In the same decade. In the same decade. And of course, don't forget Martin Luther King, also 68. 68. Malcolm X, 65. 65. Sure. It's the 60s were turbulent years, man. Turbulent. Assassination. Yeah. Threat, so it? anyway, uh, Boya is killed, uh, uh, pronounced dead, mm. uh, hospital. And then, of course, riots break out. Nairobi in Kisumu. Riots break out. It is madness. 400 policemen are deployed. Mzee Kenyatta calls, you know, immediate arrest of whoever it is, investigation, the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. 400 policemen deployed. They are plowing. They are combing through the, the, the slums of Nairobi. They come up with a guy 72 hours later. Come up with some guy. Nahashan Jenga, they called him. Mm -hmm. He was a former Kanu youth winger who used to extort Indians for money. All right. That was his thing. You know, He was a bully around town. Mm -hmm. Arrest him and they... they take him to trial in the trial he says oh no Mboya was trying one of his his, his arguments mm. Mboya was trying to overthrow the government I, and I had to take care of it and he admitted huh? he admitted he admitted and then but then as he was being sentenced to death mm -hmm. he turns around and utters the phrase what about the big man and of course the prosecution turns around and says what do you mean he says yeah what about the big man you know you I'm just the small man in this. What about the big man? Wow. 49 years later, mm -hmm. no one's ever been able to come out and say who the big man was. Of course, there were theories, mm -hmm. uh, you know, about uh, people high up in government then. Yeah. But nobody has ever come out. Nearly half a century later. Next year will be 50 years since Tom Boyer died. No one has ever come out to tell us to say something. Who killed Tom Boyer and why? More importantly, why? You know, in his village, there is this mausoleum, yeah? Mm -hmm. And it's Up in uh, Rusinga. Uh, Rusinga, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. There is, um, it's, it's, the village is called Luanda Kamasengre village. Okay. Yeah, it's in a Rusinga island. Uh -huh. There is this bullet-shaped mausoleum that stands there. You're kidding me. Can you imagine? As a stark reminder. As a stark reminder. Of the bullet that the bullet filled that. him. Can you imagine? I'm telling you, he would have made a great president after Kenyatta because he was young. He was 39 mm. years old in 69. 39. Can you imagine? Uh, yeah, life, huh? Moy Avenue. Moy Avenue was formerly known as Government Road. Mm -hmm. Right there, man. It's broad daylight. He had come back from Ethiopia, it was mm. actually. Ethiopia. So he decided, let me pass by the pharmacy, pick up a couple of things, and then head home. Imagine if he hadn't gone to the pharmacy. If he had gone straight home, you know, all these things, what would have happened? Question is, what if? What if Thomas Joseph Mboya, TJ, rest in peace. Rest in peace. You know, they're actually having a memorial. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Today? The village. Today. In the village or? Yeah, his brother Paul Ndiege confirmed. Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're actually doing that today and, uh, you know, he's the 49th, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So bring that back in the village. Oh, nice. We should go to that village one time. We're seeing the island. Should, yeah. It's good, huh? Let's take a photo next to the mausoleum. Absolutely. Bullet shaped. Bullet shaped mausoleum. Can you imagine? Mausoleum. I tell you, you can't make this stuff up. You simply can't. That's what we call a story a, a day. day.
While we lost a father, our country suffered a much bigger loss. It lost a hero, an advocate, and a champion. I can remember that particular midday afternoon in Kitui school. Everything seemed to have come to a standstill. That was how powerful the name Tom Joseph Boya was, right across the Kenyan nation. We want to say that Thomas Joseph Boya continues to live and will continue live and live forever in our country. The government appreciates the need to honor Kenyans who have served our country with a dedication. He was so powerful in his speech and in his mind, he wanted complete freedom for the black man. And I think some people felt that when Kenyatta goes, he would be the next president. When it came to the sleeping time, he refused to sleep on the bed. He said, why sleep on the bed? I know I'm dying soon. And we asked him, you know, he astonished us. Mr. Lord, you know, I'm not going to live. On the day he was shot, he had come from Addis Ababa. And he was feeling unwell, so the, the chemist was there. He went and picked a simple drug, and on coming out, the, the assailant was there. He shot him point blank there. Somebody was followed and arrested, but I don't think he was punished. Instead, the person was given scholarship to study in, in the same university where I went. I think he was assassinated because he had this one, his brain. Humphrey Slade, who was the, the speaker of National Assembly, said, Mbaya is dead. It will take you Kenyans 100 years before for you have that beautiful brain on him. I'm saying it without fear or favor. That man wanted Kenya to be huh? a peaceful country, equitable distribution of Kenya's wealth to all Kenyans. I think that's what made JM also test the bullet of the gun. I hope somebody will look for a place and put JM somewhere. Boya left a wife and five children. He is buried in a mausoleum located in Rusinga Island, which was built in 1970 with a street named after him and now a statue in his honor. But still, Sheth is not a contented man. This has come sometimes a little too late, but we are glad we are standing here to celebrate this. Since I saw this, I've been trembling here. I don't know what to do, to weep or to rejoice. I don't. But I think it's a great act of respecting a hero, a political hero.